So welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, first panel of this academic year uh, in the English at Work series that we started a few years ago. Um, I want to let you know that there's going to be another panel uh, a, one month from today, on Monday, March 26th, same time, same place, uh, with three recent alumni who went on to get their master's in library and information science and who are working in different areas of that uh, field. One's a high school um, librarian, one's a children's librarian at uh, Cambridge Public Library in Massachusetts, and one is in digital archives for the um, Pennsylvania Historical Society. So that, that's in the future. I hope you will come to that and bring some friends. Um, so today what we do have are three uh, alumni who have gone on to law school and beyond. And uh, before we introduce them, I'd like to explain that we're going to have about 45 minutes of moderated discussion, and then we'll open up the floor to questions from you all. Um, and so I'll start by introducing our moderators for today. There are two current uh, East, Eastern students, English majors. Uh, first is Ricardo Alaves. He's a sophomore English major with a concentration in rhetoric and composition and a political science minor. And he's hoping to go to law school someday. And Nadia, how do you say his name? I forgot that. Balasone, Nadia Balasone, she's a senior English major and with a retcon concentration and a business administration major as well with a marketing concentration and is planning to go to Quinnipiac Law School this fall. Um, so uh, those are our moderators. They'll be introducing our panelists. Okay, um, so first we're gonna start with Kristen Brierly. Uh, who was an honors program scholar at Eastern Connecticut State University and graduated summa cum laude in 2008 with a BA in English. In May of 2013, she earned her JD from Western New England University School of Law, graduating cum laude in the top 10% of her class and serving as editor-in-chief of the Western New England Law Review. Kristen put herself through law school at night by working full-time as a legal assistant at a labor law firm in Connecticut. She currently works as a labor relations specialist with the State of Connecticut Office of Policy and Management. Her responsibilities include facilitating collective bargaining negotiations of state employee union contracts, participating in grievance hearings and arbitrations, conducting legal research and writing memoranda, and other labor-related matters. Prior to joining the Office of Policy and Management in June 2017, Kristen served as a judicial law clerk first at the Connecticut Appellate Court, and most recently at the United States District Court for the D District of Connecticut. So our first question for Kristen um, is gonna be, as a labor legal expert, what kind of cases do you work on? Um, so in terms of caseload, uh, because I work on all of the union collective bargaining negotiations, I handle everything that comes from a union contract. So employees have the right to file grievances if they feel aggrieved by something. So at first, it'll go through your employer to try to resolve the grievance. If not, then it comes to me, and I act as a hearing officer. So I'm the one who has to hear the facts and make a decision and then issue a written answer. If that doesn't resolve the grievance, it goes forward to arbitration, which you can think of as sort of a mini trial. You have an arbitrator, you present witnesses, you write a brief. Um, so I hear everything from really low-level grievances to, I literally had one the other day where I, I wanted one extra hour of overtime and they didn't pay me and, you know, something seemingly small to major discipline, major terminations. Right now we have the Whiting Institute cases, if you've heard of any of that, with the patient abuse scandals. Um, so some of it's very high level. Um, what kind of demand is there in your field for new attorneys and... Um, so my field in particular working for the state is unique in that my job is technically JD preferred, so you don't have to be a licensed attorney to be in my job, but it definitely helps. Um, so we also have some lower level associates in our office who are not JD required or preferred. Um, and obviously since we're dealing with union contracts and state employees, 
44,000 unionized state employees. Uh, there's no shortage of work and there's no shortage of grievances and uh, collective bargaining negotiations go on every five years, but there's also midterm bargaining. Um, the CBAC negotiations that happened last year that you might have heard of in the news. So there's no shortage of work. I definitely think the field of labor law, either representing union side or representing the employers, it goes private sector, public sector. So I think there's a great demand. That's awesome. Um, have you faced any limitations or barriers to entry as a woman in your field? Um, generally, I will say no. Uh, 10 years ago when I was graduating from college and started working at a private sector labor law firm, uh, we represented unions and I felt like it was sort of a boys club, um, but I didn't feel like it was a barrier preventing me from going to law school or even entering the field of labor law. And again, that was 10 years ago. Things have only gotten better since then too. Cool. Um, next we're gonna present, sorry, next we're gonna present Samuel Lisi. Welcome back. Um, he graduated from Eastern Connecticut uh, in 2013. Uh, he received both a JD and a Master of Law in Intellectual Property and Information Governance from the University of Connecticut School of Law in 2016. Throughout his legal education, Sam provided assistance to entrepreneurs and startups on a range of intellectual property issues and he began his career with the Beasley Group in 2017 as a word console specializing in cybersecurity. He currently holds the role of TMB, product manager, through which he leads the innovation and design for all technology media initiatives across the globe. Okay, so Samuel, explain to those of us who don't know much about your field, what exactly is it that you do? So, <clears throat> the Beasley Group is primarily an insurance company, but through all of their cybersecurity offerings, they accompany that insurance with um, full 360 services. So essentially companies come to us to create solutions for them for all of their cybersecurity needs. Um, so for example, with the Equifax breach this past year, that was one of our accounts. We respond to that, we provide all the services and just deal with the breach. But for many other organizations, they need different packages that are tailored to their needs. So I create those packages, pretty much. Uh, Samuel, what benefits does pursuing a JD and a Master of Law offer? Um, I found for myself wanting to go the non-traditional route. I wanted to have something tied to me rather than just the JD because I figured it would help me get into specific areas. I knew I wanted to go into something with cybersecurity or computer science and the information governance LLM was a good, a good uh, program for me to learn some of the basics that I would have otherwise learned in uh, you know, a computer science program during undergrad, et cetera. Okay, so we're gonna uh, move on to Andrew Minikowski. Um, he graduated from Eastern Summa Cum Laude in 2012, where he double majored in English and Econ. While at Eastern, Andrew was a University Honors Scholar and completed his thesis on religious themes in one of Dostoevsky's novels. Andrew thereafter attended Vermont Law School in South Royalton, Vermont, where he was the editor-in-chief of the Vermont Journal of Environmental Law, a finalist in the National Environmental Law Moot Court Competition, and an intern with the New York Office of the Attorney General. He graduated summa cum laude in 2015 with his Juris Doctor and Master of Environmental Law and Policy degrees. Following graduation, he clerked for the Honorable Carmen E. Espinosa of the Connecticut Supreme Court and worked as an attorney for the Connecticut Fund of the Environment Incorporated in New Haven, Connecticut, where he focused his practice on land use litigation and appeals. He will shortly commence a new role as an attorney for the Connecticut Office of Consumer Council, a wholly independent agency within the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, charged with representing Connecticut ratepayers in state and federal administrative proceedings concerning energy and utility matters, related litigation and appeals, and legislative hearings before the Connecticut General Assembly and U.S. Congress. So Andrew, do you have to hug trees to be a good environmental law attorney? No, you can, you can hate the environment and be a good <laughs> environmental law attorney. Um, uh, it helps if you're interested in what you're doing. So I, I went to law school with the sole purpose of working on environmental and energy matters. Uh, and 
you know, when you're sitting reading a record in a case that's two and a half thousand pages long, it helps if you're actually interested in what you're reading. Um, so I think you just end up practicing uh, in a more effective way. But I, you know, I know some very good environmental attorneys who they just sort of, by the twists and turns of their own careers, that's the field they fell into. And they're, they're wonderful, fantastic, talented attorneys who didn't have some sort of, uh, you know, an environmental crusader hat on when they decided to work in that way. And I know other attorneys who that's, that's the reason they're in it. And I guess I would fall into that. Um, but no, you, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to be the traditional super crunchy Birkenstock wearing patchouli smelling uh, individual to be a great environmental lawyer. Thank you. Uh, is there a substantial opportunity for someone to pursue environmental law if they aren't interested in the energy sector? So it's a changing field right now. Um, you know, the, the field of environmental law really peaked in the 70s and 80s, and that's when, you know, Nationally, at the state level, we'd establish the structures of what protecting the environment using the law was going to look like. It's a lot of just hedge trimming now. There's, there's ma maintainers who are there um, ensuring that the environmental laws are enforced. Uh, there's a little more opportunity right now because of the, the great administration we have in Washington right now, uh, it, which is just not enforcing any of our nation's environmental laws, and indeed is going further to, to revoke much of the regulatory structure in place. So. Uh, there's some more opportunity than there has been in recent years to do the traditional clean water, clean air, uh, land use and land remediation uh, areas of environmental law. But as you're all aware, uh, climate change has just become the premier environmental issue of the age. And as a result, uh, energy, which, you know, there was always an overlap between energy and environmental law. Energy law has really just come to, to subsume much of what was traditionally environmental law um, issues of, of, you know, getting green energy onto the grid uh, to, to ensuring that um, inefficient plants are taken off, off the system uh, and also the environmental impacts of new forms of energy because solar and wind are great, but those have environmental impacts as well, um, which in the immediacy of getting those online, we often don't stop to consider. Um, so there is, there is substantial op opportunity to do traditional environmental work, um, but energy is just the future right now and it helps to know to at least have a grounding in it because you'll encounter it no matter what. And that just goes beyond environmental law too. Any field in the environmental arena is like that right now. I was such a purist when I went to law school that I just focused on public land management and forestry and, and bears. And then, I, I, <laughs> and then I, I left and I didn't know any of this energy stuff and it's so technical and it comes up constantly that I really had to give myself a, a layman's education on the ground. Uh, so don't do that if you, if you go to law school and are interested in environmental stuff. Get some, get some energy work under your belt. Just, you're going to encounter it no matter what. I'm writing that down. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so we're just going to move on to some general questions right now. Um, any of you can answer, all of you can answer. So our first one is how important uh, um, is maintaining an exceptional GPA in undergrad when considering law school? It's obviously important. Law school is very competitive. Um, I think more so than just GPA is having a well-rounded background coming into law school. Um, I took a year off in between college and law school, so I didn't have quite the exact traditional path. Um, and then I think the things that mattered most after law school when looking for a job were the fact that I worked in law school, I worked in college, I was first generation college, those types of things that showed who I was as an individual more so than just a number on a piece of paper. Because um, most people coming into law school applications have similar backgrounds on paper, so anything you can do to stand out I think is really important. Yeah, so I mean some of the legal programs are so competitive that really the, the traditional stats, GPA, you know, class rank, all, they, they don't really matter because everyone is so, you know, within a standard deviation of each other. So that uh, it's really the things you do outside of, of just getting good grades that really will, will make or break your application. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of factors because, you know, in undergrad, I wasn't an honors student the entire time. I didn't graduate with any form of law day or whatever else, but I was involved in a lot of things and the things that I was involved in, I, you know, I had an interest in those and being able to portray that you're well-rounded, like you mm -hmm. said, is, is very important to those who are viewing your applications and making a decision on whether or not you're someone they think is going to uh, gonna cut it, pretty much. Um, what kind of skills do you have to develop uh, to juggle both work and law school? 
I know, Kristen, you said that you, you took the time off and you worked, but you also worked during yeah. your law school? Yeah, so I started working full-time job May when I graduated from undergrad, and then I applied to law school and kept working at the law firm. So it was 40 hours a week, and it was in Connecticut, and I went to school in Massachusetts, so I was also commuting about 45 minutes each way just to law school and back. Um, so I think the most important things is time management, which you guys are probably strongly developing now in undergrad. Um, but also just putting aside things you might want to do for the things you have to do and having a really rigid schedule. Every Saturday, all Saturday, I spent at the law library. It just wasn't an option. I didn't have time at night. I didn't have time in the mornings, so I had to do it you know, on certain days and keep to that schedule. So that was my experience with working. But it helps at the end because then you don't come out with a ton of student loan debt and you're more well-rounded in terms of having worked and understanding what lawyers do, or especially if you're in a field that you want to practice in afterward. I think, and this is different from law school to law school, but many law schools actually actively discourage first-year students from working at the same time. Because for, for a lot of students, the first year of law school is extremely rigorous and it's unlike anything they've approached from an academic standpoint before. And if you're trying to juggle a shift somewhere, uh, you don't have the time to, to hit the books. Uh, I, I worked in undergrad as well with numerous part-time jobs. So I, uh, I, I was tricked into thinking that I'd be extremely busy my one all year. But I, I think being used to working at the same time as going to school, I actually found I had more free time and I ended up picking up a part-time job um, and then continued to do th so throughout law school. So it's, it's really what you're used to. Um, and uh, you know, time management really is the key to that, to be comfortable that you're balancing everything you need to balance. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, during undergrad, you know, I, I was a bouncer at Blarney's to pay for my, uh, my LSAT course. So you know, it's kind of a means to an end get done what you need to get done. But in law school, you know, I voluntarily went and teamed up with a bunch of startups and different entrepreneurs who were working on different things to kind of practice some of the intellectual property stuff that I was learning, you know, trademark work, copyrights, that kind of stuff. You know, it gives you an opportunity to see how those things play out in, in actual practice. Also, quick postscript. Um sort of merit-based financial aid and scholarships aren't as readily available in law school as they are in undergrad courses and even some other master's programs. Um, so if you can stash your cash when you're thinking about going to law school, start doing it now because you, you'll find that although you'll qualify for tons of really unfair student loans, you, you may not get sort of the merit-based free money that you, you might be getting now as an undergraduate student. And that, I know that threw me for a loop and I ended up sort of spending more than I had initially anticipated, which I will now never get out of. So. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. Um, how did you know what kind of law you wanted to practice, or when along the way did you know um, you had figured it out? Is that a hard one? Well, I guess I still haven't <laughs> figured it out. Um, <laughs> no, I think the legal practice has, has changed in the last 30 to 40 years with the rise of, of the administrative state. It used to be that everyone went to law school and you studied the same you know, 10, 12 subjects and you went out and everyone was Atticus Finch. You could write wills, you could represent drunk drivers, you, you looked at someone's contract. It was, it was very much a, a general practice atmosphere, but it's become much more compartmentalized in, over the last few decades that now most law students decide, they don't major in something, but they, they find an area of interest in law school that, that suits them, and then you try to target your career to that when you, when you get out the door. Um, and that, it's hard to tell in law school what the prospects of that will be. I mean, you're almost in an echo chamber at times. At least I was. I went to a, a, a law school that has one of the best, I believe it's still the best, environmental law program in the country. So I was surrounded by people that were really excited and really enthusiastic about environmental and energy issues, and it was, it was rare to hear someone be like, oh yeah, you're not gonna get a job doing that, because everyone was just so convinced that we're going to save the world, which we are. But um, it's, you know, it's, you, you really have to, to plan it. It's such an investment of time and money going to law school that you gotta be certain that it's something you wanna do. And there's no shame in going and realizing it's not for you. I know some brilliant people that did that. Um, I know for me at least, I just, uh, e even though studying English and studying economics here at Eastern didn't per se involve environmental issues, it was just something that I always so cared about so deeply that I knew if there was something that could sustain me over the course of a career, it was that. I mean, things weren't getting any better then, they're a lot worse now. There would always be work for me to do that was meaningful to me at a personal level. So that was the deciding factor, in my case at least. 
think building upon that, you sort of touched upon it. Um, you need to be sure that you want to go to law school, but that doesn't mean you have to know exactly what you want to do when you're done with law school. Um, I had a criminal law concentration in law school. I thought I wanted to be a prosecutor. And I did an internship my last semester, and I realized that although I was good at it and I enjoyed it, I just couldn't see myself doing it forever. So it's okay to change your mind. Um, and I think another thing that we share in common too is clerking after law school. If you're not sure what you wanna do and maybe you just have a general sort of law degree and you didn't specialize in anything, clerking at any level, state, federal, it doesn't matter, it's an invaluable experience and the judge you clerk for might have connections in a certain field or you might work on cases that help you identify what you want to practice. So I think there's ways around not knowing exactly what you want to do right off the bat, but you have to know that you want to do law school. And if you get into it and you decide it's not for you, don't waste your time, don't waste your money, don't waste the effort. Just it, there's no shame in, in realizing it's not right. I actually never wanted to practice law. I mean, I, I went to law school knowing that I wasn't going to be a traditional, you know, stand in front of the judge lawyer type, type guy. I saw the value of the skills you would take from law school in business and other areas of the workplace, um, the same way that your English degree is of value to you in places other than just, you know, being a teacher or whatever else. You know, the skills that you take from these programs aren't limited to how they're titled. So, you know, you could go to law school knowing that you don't really want to be a lawyer, but use the lawyer's skills to do other things. Next question. <clears throat> uh, how important was networking for you guys, especially in your um, respective fields? Oh, it's so important, and I hate it. I hate it so much, and everyone hates it, but law really is one of those professions where it helps to know people uh, and, and to cultivate those connections. And as mentioned, one of the best ways to do that as a young attorney is to clerk for any judge in any court. I mean, obviously try to steer it towards a place you want to be, but having a judge in your corner to vouch for you as you go through your career is, is absolutely invaluable. Um, and you also learn a lot doing it too. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely professional networking. It, mm -hmm. It's miserable and leaves a foul taste in your mouth, but you have to swallow it. I completely agree. <laughs> Um, every job I've gotten after law school was a result of networking and who the people I worked for knew. Um, so it's vital. I actually didn't network in law circles, though. You know, I, I knew tech and entrepreneurship, that kind of stuff was the way I was going. So, you know, I would, I would go to different conferences, different tech shows, all that kind of stuff, and see where my skill sets would fit into what different people were trying to to accomplish. Okay, so how can students begin to expose themselves outside of academia to become visible in the legal community? Kind of going off the last question. I mean, it's kind of hard to, to get like an internship or, or a, a summer experience or something doing legal work as an undergraduate where you won't just be doing sort of busy work um, because there's law students that are looking for summer internships, et cetera, and they, they tend to get to do, do the things you get a little more exposed. But then again, there are places that are so overburdened that they'll probably take anyone who wants help. If you go down the street to Connecticut Legal Services here in Willimantic, they have an office and it's you know, helping low-income folks that can't afford an attorney and have some civil litigation problem. Uh, I'm sure they'll help you do, in, they'll let you help do intake or, or things like that. So, you know, the public defender's office, I'm sure, is swamped and would take volunteers. I mean, so it's, I guess it's just be strategic and looking for for places you, you might want to get some, get some exposure. Once you're in law school, something I found was, at least in Connecticut, the Connecticut Bar Association has, as part of their young attorneys section, you can be a student member. So I did that in law school and it was very inexpensive or maybe even free. And you could attend, I think it was either monthly or every other month, you could attend events and meet other young attorneys and also uh, older mentors who you might interact with down the road. So that's once you're in law school. You could also try to intern at places where you know that there are lawyers working, doing the kind of work that you would want to do. I mean, I have friends who would uh, intern with different real estate companies knowing that she wanted to do real estate law even though she wasn't a legal intern. She was able to interact with the different stuff that was going on with the legal team and learn almost by proxy. I think 
too, and this is important to remember, is uh, courtrooms are open to the public. So if you just want to go see what a trial looks like, if you want to go see what an appellate oral argument looks like, you can walk in and sit down and no one's going to tell you to leave unless it's some sensitive child protection matter. Um, so if you're interested in criminal law, go sit down on some criminal arraignments and see how crazy it gets, because it gets crazy. You know, if you're interested in, in sort of very formal appeals or something, you know, go take a, a morning, go down to Hartford and sit in the appellate court, sit in the Supreme Court and just see what it's like. I think that's helpful to sort of dispel a lot of the sort of pop culture ideas of what being a lawyer looks like. My turn, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, were there any English classes that you think were especially helpful in preparing you for law school? Or are there any kind of classes you would recommend to English majors interested in law school? Um, I guess I can start. So uh, any class dealing with composition and rhetoric, um, <laughs> those, that's, I mean, that's what practicing law is. It's writing argument, it's structuring argument, it's learning how to appeal to an audience and, and how to persuade them of something they might not be persuaded of. And I mean, that's, that's the meat of practicing law. Um, but also, I, I, was, I was saying this earlier today too, um, law is one of those odd professions where you can make an obnoxious literary reference and get away with it. Um, either in, in a brief, you can use it to illustrate a point uh, to a judge or an oral argument, you can, um, you can use it as well. I mean, it's one of the benefits of being in a profession where everyone is highly educated, is people tend to, tend to know, uh, tend to have been rather well read, so you can, you know, the, all the poetry and novels actually do come in handy, um, at least in practicing law, I think. have any in particular. Um, I know a friend of mine here majored in political science and minored in philosophy. And I never took a philosophy class, but a lot of the LSAT involves logical reasoning, and I've heard that that can be helpful too. So even if you don't minor or double major, taking a philosophy class I don't think can hurt. So The one, the one course that I could think of is, uh, like you said, rhetorical theory with, uh, I think it was Donahue who was teaching that. Yeah. Perhaps, might have been DeRosa, yeah. Either way, that, that course was great just to help you start thinking differently and looking at things differently, so. I totally forgot about the LSAT because I blocked it from my <laughs> mind. But I, one of the helpful classes I did take was, um, I think it was propositional logic, something logic. Rather than take an LSAT prep course, I just took that and it it did the same stuff. You learned how to do logical proofs and, and think in the ways that were necessary to tackle what is a totally arbitrary exam that's just used to separate wheat from chaff in a totally inefficient, inefficient way. You can tell how I feel about the LSAT. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's a philosophy it's class, on, yeah. It's called logical inquiry, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so besides what we talked about before, do you have any additional advice for a first year law student? Um, this is very practical advice. Um, I did not use a laptop in class. I started to, and I found it to be way too distracting with people on Gchat, and it's just too much. So I took all my notes by hand, and I felt like it really stuck a lot better. Um, but also, when I was in college, it wasn't, I wasn't really using a laptop in college either, so in terms of class. Um, so for me, that really made a big difference, and outlining as you go through the semester is very important, otherwise you'll end up in December or April and panic about how much you have to relearn in a way for your finals. Um, and for those of you who don't know, you have one exam in law school for each class, and that makes up your entire grade. Um, so it's really important to be prepared and to prepare as much in advance so that you're not caught short right at the last minute. Um, I have to agree with not using a laptop. I didn't use a laptop either, and one, that's because I, I can't stand them. But two, um, I, it was the same thing. It's so distracting. You're in an, an amphitheater with 100, 150 other law students, and there's a sea of laptops that you can see in front of you. I, I vividly remember during my uh, con law class, my second semester of law school, someone was watching a March Madness game. So of course, everyone behind them was also watching a March Madness game. And it was the game where the guy landed and his shin just broke in half. So there was just a roar of agony from the entire class. And I, our professor just stopped and he was like, you know, 
the dormant commerce clause can't be that agonizing. What are you all <laughs> screaming about? And someone had to fess up and be like, oh, this guy's shin just broke in half. So like, I found that you taking notes by hand was just, I absorbed it a lot more quickly. And then there was the added benefit of when everyone was hiding behind a laptop, the four or five people that weren't, the professor remembered your face in a big class and, and knew who you were. And that, that makes such a difference. Um, in law school, classes are generally taught with the Socratic method, so a professor will just pluck someone out of the crowd and, and badger them to death about something. Um, you have and seating charts with your name, so they call you yeah. out by name depending on who they want to pick on that day. And yeah, like one time I had taken too much cold medicine. They're like, oh, Mr. Minikowski, can you describe the doctrine of something? I was like, ha, no, but that doesn't work. You have to describe it. Um, so um, <laughs> I... I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, when I wasn't using a laptop, I found that I started getting cold called a lot more frequently, which wasn't necessarily a good thing, but at the same time, it, it was, because it forced me to be prepared for class in a way that some other folks may not have been, and also made me more comfortable with speaking about things I didn't know about in front of a large number of people, like right now. Um, uh, so that's the big thing. The other big thing I would take away, too, is let, your, let yourself get immersed in things you may not be comfortable with. The first year of law school, it's the same everywhere. You take sort of the same core legal classes, and a lot of them you're not going to find interesting, or they may not have any bearing on what you think you want to do. I remember just suffering, just suffering through contracts because it was so dry and so boring to me that I, I almost could not even read the material. But you have to. You just have to know it. And then it came back to haunt me when I was studying for the bar exam, and I didn't know any of the contracts material and had to relearn it all from scratch. So just be comfortable with working on some, you know, be, keep an open mind, as, as I guess what I'm saying is, feel free to delve into something that you may know you're never going to do, but you gotta know it at some level. One suggestion that I would make, um, and I think this is applicable specifically to, you know, our generation is, we do so much through text and email and all of that, that um, I feel like sometimes we don't practice articulating ourselves, actually speaking to someone, so with that Socrative method, you know, you have to articulate your thoughts to the class, to the professor. So on top of the public speaking, you need to be able to speak in a way that's clear and makes sense. So I would suggest that in your classes now, start actively participating so that you can practice articulating your thoughts and communicating them effectively. Um. What was law school actually like for you? Um, was it what you guys expected before you went in? No. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to sound arrogant in any way, but I think a lot of you too are going to have the experience of coming from college. You've done really well. You've gotten into law school. You know how to study. You know how to take tests. And you feel really confident. And then you go to law school and you're surrounded by everyone else who's exactly like you and just as confident and just as skilled and just as educated. Um, and my first exam, so I was a night student, so we actually had a midterm and then a final. So it wasn't my entire grade, but my first grade was a 68. And I panicked. I had a complete freak out. I'd never seen those digits together ever. And it just terrified me. And I thought that I couldn't do it. And I just had to change the way I studied. I met with the professor. I went to office hours. Um, so I forget where I was going with this. But it is not what you expect. It is not like undergrad. Um, but you know yourself. And you guys have all gotten to that point where you're considering law school. Or maybe you're applying now or have been accepted. You can do it. Um, it just is different. It's very different. I, I have to agree. Um, you know, I, I went to law school and was like, I've got this. I'm a smart guy. You know, you're surrounded by other people that are brilliant. Um, and then one of the first writing assignments I had in a, in a torts class, which coincidentally was a class I did not care about, um, I, I got an 80-something on a writing assignment, which sounds ridiculous to complain about, but I was so offended. I, I was just so, so perturbed that someone had dared to decide that my writing was an 86. And what it came down to was just, lawyers write differently, and I had to learn that. So sometimes you have to, you have to relearn skills you think you've already mastered in a way that, that you can retain what you already know, but recognize that you're working in sort of a different, very insular world that has its traditions that go back quite a way. Um, and that, that can be, that can throw people off, sometimes to the point where they, they decide it's not for them or where you struggle for a bit to fit in. And I think once I realized that I just had to reconsider how I was doing things, it was an easy transition, but 
it's hard because you're, I mean, the pressure, the pressure is on because um, you're surrounded by you know, people who are your equals and everything and it's very competitive. And it changes from law school to law school too. I mean, some law schools are so competitive that if you leave your notes unattended in the library, someone will go like throw them in the trash so you fail the class. I mean, I, I went to a law school that looked more like a summer camp than a law school, so it, it wasn't really like that. Um, but you, it's, it's an odd moment where you, you're trapped with a group of people that are all competing against each other, but at the same time, you don't want to, you don't want to go sour on anyone because you're going to be trapped with the same hundred whatever people in your class for the next three years. Um, <clears throat> I didn't expect it to be as painful as it was, at least until you, know, you find a way to be flexible and make it work for you. But you know, in hindsight, it's like training for anything. It's, it's supposed to be very difficult because it's worth it. So unless you're not up for the challenge, you know, you, you kind of have to expect that it's going to be a painful experience. But it doesn't have to be as painful as, uh, you know, a lot of people might think it is because like, you know, like we set up here, you kind of learn to adjust your own way of doing things to make it work for you. So it's different for everyone. I think what's important to keep in mind is law school, unlike an undergraduate course of study, is you're, you're not learning a body of material so much as that you're learning a, a new way of thinking and, and processing information. Um, and it's kind of like boot camp almost. You know, everyone shows up with their own backgrounds and they're trying to mold you into one, at the core, sort of similar skill set that everyone should have in common. And depending on what your experience was beforehand, that can be easy or it could be difficult. Um, this again kind of goes off of what you just said, but did you ever feel over, in over your head in law school or were you able to handle the workload? Of course, of course there are moments where you're feeling in over your head. You feel like you can't manage everything. Something has to give. Um, but having been out of law school five years now, I look back at it and of course I can pinpoint some super low moments and some super high moments, but overall it's just a blur. You get through it, you trudge through, a necessary end if you want to be a lawyer. So um, that's my take on it. At the beginning of my second year of law school, we had a course that everyone had to take where you were assigned an actual United States Supreme Court case that was before the court but hadn't been argued yet. And you had to write all the briefing in it and then eventually argue it as if you were the lawyer for that case. So of course, these are all in incredibly cerebral issues and writing an appellate brief is an enormous undertaking. It's pages and pages and pages and, and tons of research. And I, I had to write mine on this incredibly narrow issue in the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which covers tribal gaming. Um, and I, I, I had been in the library for about three days straight with a, a friend of mine. We're both working on our briefs and I was like, I need a break. And I went out and sat on the quad and was reading Joseph Conrad and I couldn't focus on the page because my eye was twitching so uncontrollably um, that, and that had never happened to me before. And it was totally like a physical manifestation of stress um, that I, I hadn't felt. Um, but it's, it's kind of sad, but a lot of practicing laws like that too, there are these really high adrenaline moments where you just have to, to go at it. Um, so it can be overwhelming, but it can also be really fun. You get a chance to do a lot of, a lot of things where there's no pressure, like um, moot court. Um, you're not actually in a courtroom, so if you make a mistake, it's not a big deal, but you get a chance to, to learn how to, to do a trial or to do an appellate argument. Um, and I think law schools, and law students in particular, realize that everyone's stressed out and miserable, so a lot of law schools have great student groups, uh, at least mine did, that are always planning cool activities to, to keep everyone engaged at a social level and mentally healthy at some level as well. The only times I actually felt overwhelmed in looking at this hindsight now is, is in the moments where I resisted being flexible, when I needed to do something a certain way and doing it the way that I wanted to do it was very difficult and therefore I felt overwhelmed. So unless you allow yourself to conform to the way that they want you to do things and they want you to think about things, it will be overwhelming. But once you start to actually go with this, this new style of learning, this new style of thinking, it becomes easier and easier. All right, this is gonna be the last question before we open up the floor, so you guys can start you know, thinking about your questions. Um, <clears throat> so, are there any other majors or minors in addition to English that you think would be especially useful as preparation for law school? I mean, I guess I can speak to that because I had another major. Um, 
when I started taking my substantive environmental law courses in law school, I was like an idiot savant at it for the first like two months because most of our, our federal environmental law, which was written in the 1970s, um, some nameless you know, legislative page in the US Capitol just cracked open an economics textbook and copied a bunch of the models and wrote them out in statutory form. So I was looking at the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act and looking at how these statutes actually work in practice, how they regulate companies from discharging particular amounts of pollutants and I recognized it. I knew it because it was stuff I had studied here at Eastern in my, my economics degree. It was such a weird moment to see something like that in another form in practice in real life, something that was totally theoretical and now it was there on the page in front of me. Um, but I think what's interesting about law school is it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was in class next to people who had studied art. Um, my, one of my best friends, her background was in uh, climate science and meteorology. Um, uh, you, I mean, it does, people come from all different backgrounds. You have people who come straight out of undergrad, people who worked for a time and then went back to school to go to law school. It, it's really, as long as you, you have the drive to work on it. Um, and sometimes you're lucky, and if you studied philosophy or, or um, English, you, you may have an edge here and there um, with knowing a few things that other folks don't know or grasping something a bit more quickly. But it's... I think it's more of a personal challenge rather than whether you, a question of whether you have particular coursework that's valuable. Yeah, for law school itself, I agree with that completely, that it might be a value, but it's not essential. Um, thinking longer term and what you're actually gonna be doing with your legal education and where you're gonna actually plug that in, it makes more sense to align other interests with that. So like I said, you know, I didn't have a computer science background in undergrad, so I had to do that while doing the law stuff, you know? So if I had that beforehand, it would have made it easier once I went into that field of work, applying those, uh, those skill sets. So it's a long-term thing. For law school, it doesn't have the same significance. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, my name is Patrice. I'm sorry, I talk very loud. Um, I'm a sophomore, so I'm still like on the verge of like, figuring out exactly what I want to do. Um, but if I do choose law school, like, does it matter what school a student attends? Like, how crucial is that? Um, so right now, there are more law schools than there have ever been. There are more law students coming out of law school than there have ever been. So that's definitely changed the the career field, you have to be careful. There's a lot of like junk law schools out there that look good on paper and look it on their website, and, but then you look at, look at things like their employment rates after graduation, uh, one year, two years out. Um, look at how many students get into clerkships afterwards. Um, but it depends what you want to do. I mean, it's part of the reason I went to the law school I did was because I knew I wanted to do environmental law. So I went to a law school that had an incredibly strong program with that, and it made all the difference. If you went to my law school and you wanted to do criminal law, maybe it wasn't the best fit for you. You might not have gotten the, the opportunities uh, that you wanted. Say you want to do intellectual property law or something. Look for schools that have the, the highest ranked programs in that and, and seek those out. Obviously, there are the big few law schools where it doesn't matter what you study. You're going to get a fantastic job when you come out of them. But So just be targeted in it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Simone. Um, I was wondering if you're like if you're given a mentor and advisor when you enter the school that you're that you go to, or if you're just by yourself the whole time. Yeah, th yeah, those resources are available to you. There's someone who's at least at UConn. There was somebody who was assigned to me the first year, and you know, after that first year, you. Uh, either maintain the relationship on your own or you don't, but they're no longer assigned to you. But that first year when it's really, really crazy, there is someone that's available to you. Are you talking students or professors? Oh, yeah, students. Professors. Yeah, so I had, a, I had a student mentor who was a, uh, a 3L, so. Oh, I'm sorry, like an advisor, like at Eastern, where you're given an advisor that gives you like a code to like write in your classes? Are you given one like that? In no, not in that. The first time I had a faculty advisor in law school was once I was in law review and was writing my student note, and I was paired with a faculty member who was an expert in that field. Um, but otherwise, I went to a smaller law school, so I felt very close to the administration. I never had an issue with you know, trying to get an answer to a question. And 
Uh, you're not really picking your classes in the way that you do in undergrad, at least the first year they are chosen for you and every student in law school across the country is taking the same classes. Um, so it's not as vital, but I feel like most of my professors were super accessible. They all hold office hours, so there's always a way to even make that happen for yourself. Yeah, I think it depends on the school. Every school has their own regime of how they handle it. I know I had an assigned faculty advisor my first year who I never met with once and then I don't even know what happened to her. Um, but um, I think what you'll do is end up gravitating towards a particular professor or member of administration that you know will be able to, to help you with what you're interested in doing and re make the right recommendations. But it, it is a lot less amorphous than an undergraduate program. It's, it's pretty guided in terms of a course of study with a little variation here and there. So you don't have to worry so much, sort of just, it just happens. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matt. I'm a senior at Waterford High School and a prospective Eastern student. Um, my question is, how did Eastern help prepare you for the LSATs in law school? And what do you believe best prepared you for the LSATs? Luck. Um, <laughs> so the LSAT is actually really straightforward, except for the one section about logic. That's the part that everyone stumbles on. The rest of it is just reading and writing comprehension, um, similar to stuff that you would find in the SAT or other standardized tests. Um, as I mentioned, I took a course in logic, but even, even then, I just I had no patience for it, which I think was the greatest hurdle to me. Also, the power went out when I was taking the LSAT, and it was like December, and the, the proctors were like, just keep taking it, you don't want to do this twice. And by the end of the exam, it was like, it was like you would see everyone's breath in the room. It really put the pressure on. Um, but I think just approach it, approach it like it really matters. I think there's a, a temptation for a lot of people, myself included, where when it comes to standardized tests to just sort of shirk it off and go and, and sort of see what happens. You can't do that with this one. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, there's no correlation. There's been study after study. There's no correlation showing a high LSAT score with success in law school. It's really just a way to winnow the field of applications. So, I took a traditional LSAT prep course through Kaplan. Um, I felt like it provided me with some experience of taking the test and doing it in a timed setting where you know what you're facing. Um, but otherwise, again, mostly reading comprehension, those are the skills that you would learn at Eastern, especially in the field of English or other majors like that. Um, yeah, I also did Kaplan, and I agree with everything she said. Any other questions from the audience? I have two more questions, unless you have one, Patrice. Fine. <laughs> so you said like there's not, I guess, like too many like um, like financial based available for law school, um, but like would like does like program like PhD or PhD JD program like would PhD cover like your juris doctorate? So know this is kind of weird. The juris doctor sort of falls outside of the the traditional sort of MA or M whatever PhD professional route that exists, because it's a holdover from like medieval colleges where you, oh, okay. you know, there's like law, theology, and, and medicine. Um, so it's, it's a professional degree that a lot of places treat as an equivalent to a PhD, um, but it's, it's sort of like a, it's a creature of its own. Um, but I, I, yeah, it, it's, it is reality that it's sort of merit-based, easily accessible money is, is less available to law students. So that should be a huge consideration in where you consider attending. I mean, like UConn, you get in-state tuition if you're a Connecticut resident. That's great. Like, if you can, if you can do that, you're going to save a lot of money. Um, but also, a lot of schools, too, have large endowments designed mm -hmm. to rec rec recruiting people who are good, who might not be able to afford um, uh, uh, an education. So it, there's no shame in bartering. Uh, once I realized that the money was not going to be forthcoming from law schools, that's what I started to do. You play them off each other. You call them up and say, hey, I got into your rival who, who has the other competing program, and they throw more cash at you, and then you call the other one back, and they throw more cash at you. I did this it's between, I did this between uh, the law school I went to and Pace, which has the number three environmental law program, for like a month and a half until I got to the point where no one was going higher, and then I decided where I was going to go, which is so terrible and mercenary, but it, you got to do it. It's whatever works. Also, after your first year when grades are posted, uh, I found that there was more scholarship available that you could apply for. Yeah. Um, so my, my scholarship package increased after my first year. Um, and I chose the law school I went to based on the financial package, period. Um, that was it for me. 
because I don't know that it really matters as much where you go to law school or what the name is on your degree, as long as you're making the most of it and you're doing things like law, uh, law review and clerking after law school, those things can kind of make up for if you're not going to a top 10 law school. Or... Any other questions? Um, I guess mine would be, were you able to live like somewhat of a normal life in law school or throughout? I mean, I, I, as much as I live a normal life, I guess <laughs> <laughs> I, I lived a normal life in law school. I, uh, my law school was located in a 600 town, 600 person town in Vermont in the White River Valley and it would be winter from October to May essentially. Um, we were white, right on the White River, so in between classes I would trundle down there and go fly fishing and I always had time to, to hang out with friends and, and go hiking and skiing and take in the, you know, the panoply of activities that Vermont has to, to offer. Um, but it's like anything else, you're so busy you sort of have to schedule to make sure you have a, a day or part of a day each week where you're not doing anything related to law school because that's how you burn out. Yeah, I mean, you treat it like a job. My, my approach when I was in law school was, you know, you have a few hours of class every day and then you know, the rest of it making up an eight-hour day is studying and whatever else that you need to do. Um, I know that the law schools propose ridiculous amounts of time that you're supposed to spend on studying and reading and whatever else, but I, I felt that y you have to have balance, so treating it like a nine-to-five job was, was what worked for me. It's kind of a custom thing based on you know, what your lifestyle is like, pretty much. My experience was different with working full-time. I would leave my house at 7 a.m. and get home after 10 p.m. Uh, four nights a week, so it wasn't as, you know, yeah. tr a, tr a traditional law school path. Um, but, and I said I worked on Saturdays at the law school, but I always had Sundays, and I would still see my friends and family, and it's just a few years, and you get through it. And I commuted with a friend of mine as well, so I always had that time, too. I wasn't a total, like, shut-in, um, so. It's also, it, it fluctuates sort of wildly. The end of semester crunch before finals is, is far beyond anything you could ever experience in undergrad. I mean, it, it, most everyone is studying pretty much 24-7 for about two weeks before exams hit because your whole grade is that, is that one exam and it's not like a 45 minute answer to multiple choice questions and leave. It's like a four and a half hour, write me 20 pages on this one legal question and provide like a complete analysis. So you really have to know everything. And often you can, you can bring in something, but it's usually a, a, a small outline or something. You can't photocopy every US Supreme Court case and bring it to the exam. So. Um, there, you just have to sort of budget sometimes in advance, knowing you know those two weeks in December or May, I'm not gonna have a life, don't plan anything. I got married in law school though, so I mean, it, I wasn't like, you know, there are times where you, know, you have uh, family commitments or you have your own life going on, and again, as long as you're managing your time, and there's always a way to fit in life while you're going to law school. Last one more. So last one before we close the show. Uh, what kinds of jobs are there for JDs besides being an attorney? So would you say a uh, law degree is versatile? Be an excellent person. Huh? You can do whatever you want with a JD. I mean, think of a job where you don't have, to, especially now, you know, in today's culture, think of a job that doesn't involve reading and writing constantly. I mean, if, if, if you're in a business, if you're in anything, it's going to involve contracts, it's going to involve negotiating, it's... You know, these are all skill sets that you hone in law school. So, you know, the, the JD is applicable almost universally, the skill sets that you take from that. So don't ever feel like just because you're in law school, you have to be a lawyer. There's an infinite number of possibilities of what you could do. The friend who I commuted to law school with worked at Travelers during the day and went to law school because her boss had a JD and she wanted to keep climbing the corporate ladder and thought that that would be a good avenue to do it. And she's currently still there and now she's gone up in several promotions and she uses her JD every day, but she's never practiced law nor does she plan on it. That's another thing. It's a great negotiating tool in moving up the corporate, you know, the corporate hierarchy and negotiating higher sal salaries. If you have a JD, it, it puts you in a completely different bracket, so. 
Yeah, I guess I, I don't have as much to say with this because I followed a, a more of a traditional route and things that require a law degree. Um, but it really, it really is one of those degrees where it's, it appeals to people um, and it, it identifies a particular skill set that the second someone sees JD or, or Esquire after your name, they know that you have that skill set. And that's, that is desirable for people. One of the, the uh, groups of folks that I run into frequently who have JDs but don't need them are lobbyists which sounds filthy, but there, there are lobbyists who lobby for good things, they just never win. Um, so if you go to the state capitol and, and talk to some of the lobbyists who are there waiting around in the, the office building, I mean, many of them are, are lawyers, but they're not practicing. It's just one of those areas where you have an advantage because of the skill set you have as a lawyer. You, it's easier for you to, di to digest legislation and to talk about how to amend a bill or how to, to, to get something to happen on the, in the legislature. So there, I mean, there really are a multitude of possibilities beyond the typical file stuff in court and stand up in front of a judge career path, bless you. All right, um, that'll pretty much do it. Uh, could we give the panelists a round of applause, please? <laughs> <laughs>